Hey there, Justin Chamness here, Real Estate Wholesalers Club, where we're all about helping you get to that first deal paycheck, that shut up money, where you can tell your naysayers, you can tell all the people that have been down in your dreams, <laughs> you can tell that voice on the inside that's been telling you you'll never succeed. You can finally tell it to shut up because this works. Guys, we have a special guest here with us today. Welcome to the Saturday edition of the Shut Up Money Show. This is a regular weekend podcast style show where we, we try to bring you that special extra something something that will help you get across the finish line, the goal line. It's not really a finish line. It's just a get started line, but get to the, that shut up money because it's a mind freak. It'll change you. OK, you'll never be the same again. Our guest today has forgotten more about entrepreneuring and entrepreneurship than you or I will hope to ever learn. <laughs> We've had this guest before. Um, he is Dr. Dr. Terrence Brown um, from the United States, currently living in Europe. <clears throat> he is known as Europe's leading expert in entrepreneurship for the second time let me welcome dr dr terrence brown how you doing hey. dr terrence brown hey justin glad to be here looking forward to it <laughs> great man it's awesome to see you here i really appreciate you taking your time to be here um a guy of your caliber of your knowledge of your ex wisdom and experience uh, to take time to be with us is is very special we, we're, we feel very honored today um, no, I'm part of the VIP club. I'm, I'm part of the gang. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you are. You're a charter member of the VIP club, man. I'm so honored to have you there. Thank you for, for being a part of that. Um, you've brought a lot of value to our, to our group. And I, I know you're going to bring a lot of value today. Um, when we were talking about you coming on, I had mentioned that I think what uh, stirred in me the most the last time you and I visited here on Saturday was some of the things you got into about uh, the entrepreneurial mindset, some of the things that you talked about um, as far as some basic skills that an entrepreneur, these were some things you touched on, basic skills an entrepreneur needs to have or needs to develop as they get started. Otherwise, you know, maybe not so much successful. I know being an entrepreneur myself, uh, being an entrepreneur has required a change. I've had to change. I've had to grow. I've had to adopt some new habits. <laughs> I've had to develop some new skills. And if you ask me, because I'm not the expert, I would have a hard time putting my finger on just the, the exact things um, because there's been so many. But could you, let's start out, if, if you don't mind, I'm just going to fire a question at you, but you can share a screen, right? And you're going to dive into what you want to dive into. But I thought I'd kick off with, um, can you give us a couple, two or three things that, that we as entrepreneurs, besides learning how to get leads, besides learning how to close on the phone, those are things that I beat to death every day. Um, what are some other things, some other skill sets that we are really to be successful required to kind of develop in that maybe don't come natural to us? It's a good question. And I do have a presentation that I'll get into as soon as, uh, as soon as we uh, are ready. But the things that usually uh, you talk about are uh, risk propensity, innovativeness, and proactivity. And those three things are what uh, sets apart an entrepreneur. So let me go into those a little bit. There. There's a kind of hundred dollar word. So let me yeah, just what, 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 break, what, break them what, down a little bit. What he what? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So the, the first, what I said was risk propensity. And, and that's your proclivity, let's say, to, uh, to take on risk. You have to be able to, uh, uh, to handle risk. Now, risk is a little bit interesting in that uh, people tend to think that entrepreneurs are these huge risk takers. But in fact, once you dig down into the, the data and you kind of get away from the hype, entrepreneurs actually are a little bit less uh, risky 
than the average person because you lay off risk by getting outside investment, by trying to put little money in the deal, by uh, outsourcing work. And so these are, th these are not things that a risk taker takes. These are things that a person that is very, very concerned about risk taking. All action requires risk. When you take a step off the curb, you think you're going to be safe, but you don't really know. So all action uh, entails some risk. So, but an entrepreneur needs to be able to just be aware of that, that sort of thing. So that's one thing. The next thing has to be uh, this innovativeness. And that is, in a nutshell, it's being able to be creative in his or her problem solving. If a, if a problem still exists, that means that there aren't really good solutions for that particular problem. So what an entrepreneur uh, has to do is be a little bit creative in his or her problem solving. So that's, that's the second thing. And the last thing has to do with uh, action-oriented, being action-oriented. Ha nothing happens unless you make it happen. Uh, you can learn, you can read, you can uh, be ready and have your website, everything. But unless you take action, nothing is going to happen. So those are kind of the three major things. I'm gonna go into some, uh, some depth here with some information that I actually haven't really shared publicly in about 16 or 17 years that I went, dusted it off just for you, Justin, for today. So I'm looking forward to, uh, uh, to Man, getting into this. I now, appreciate that, that sounds exciting. To do, the, to do this though, I'm going to uh, let people know uh, in advance that I am going to be speaking a little bit quickly. So just uh, clean out your <laughs> clean out your ears and uh, and be and be ready and be ready for it. But uh, be ready. I, I don't know exactly how long it'll take, but uh, it's going to take a good while, and then we'll be open for uh, uh, for questions. And if there's something that you just have to you can't you can't hold back, then feel free to uh, uh, just uh, let me know or let Justin know or something, and then we can uh, we can take a break. That's but great. I'm ready. I'm ready to go whenever you whenever you give the word, Doctor Terrence. Let's go. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Here we go. Let's see. Okay. Can everybody see that blue, just blue screen there? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So let's get let's get going here. Ah, it's not letting me. It's not letting me go. Hold on here. Why isn't it letting me? Well, it has to it has to travel a long way, right? Because you're in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, 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 no. Uh, am I on the right? Uh, there you go. Yeah, but it's it's a PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, that's it. Okay, so welcome to welcome to my world here. Now this is this is driving me crazy here. It's not working. Hmm. Do you see my screen here? No. I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. You. Yep. Okay. Yep. You were not... sharing screen. We saw the blue screen. We saw the welcome to my world. Right. But I couldn't yep. move ahead. So let me see here. Can you see? Let me just try to share screen again. Sure. No problem. Take your time, Dr. Terrence. Technology is a wonderful thing. Oh, it when is. it when it works, it's not letting me move ahead. There you there go. You you're you're moving. You okay, you can see that. You yeah, okay. moving around. Okay, so this isn't exactly the way that I wanted to uh, to do it, but who cares? What I'm going to do also is I'm going to uh, give these uh, slides to uh, Justin. So just to keep your ears open and your minds open, and don't try to take uh, any notes if that's something that you 
we're thinking about doing. So what, what is my role here? So some of you are, are trying to be full-time real estate investors. Some of you are working uh, jobs and whatnot. And you hear, you need to read this book. You need to go to this website. You need to uh, do this and that. You don't have enough time to do all those things. So what my role is, is to basically scan the universe and find out what the, the truth is and kind of cut through all of the, uh, all of the BS and, and kind of uh, uh, break it down into some simple, actionable steps uh, for you. So I'm kind of your nerd. So, uh, so you don't have to be. So you can focus on the action and I'm going to provide some of the information, some of the uh, tools in the action. So that's, that's what my role is here. And for today, the objective is this, is to get you to think, okay? Is to get you to think and also not to bore you so much that you go to sleep. Now, if you get a headache at the end of this, uh, I'm sorry, um, not too sorry, a little sorry, uh, but don't worry about it. That's okay. Cause that means that you're trying to process what I am, uh, what I'm saying. So a basic definition of entrepreneurship is this, the process of coordinating resources to exploit opportunities that exist in the environment or created through innovation in an attempt to create value. All you need to know is that entrepreneurship is a process. It's not necessarily starting a firm. It's not necessarily about small firms although it could be, it's not necessarily about new firms, but it could be, but the process can take place in larger organizations as well. It's about solving a problem, okay? And to do that, you have to gather resources to put to solving that problem. But the resources do not have to be owned by you. You can borrow them, you can lease them, you can use them and, and, and get them in so many other different ways. Your partners can have them, but it's the process of trying to create value by exploiting an opportunity that uh, exists in the market or is created through innovation. So the key thing here is, okay, I have to manage resources to take advantage of an opportunity and my goal is to create value. Now the question is, who do you create, who are you th thinking about creating value for? Well, as the uh, entrepreneur, you wanna create value for yourself. But the best way to create value for yourself is to create value for the customer. So if you focus on creating value for the customer, you will create value for yourself. And I love entrepreneurship because it's like alchemy. In fact, it's better than alchemy. So alchemy, what the heck is alchemy? Yeah, alchemy is that, that, uh, <laughs> that process that you, that you have in the back of your head yeah. where you have these wizards and these wizards would be trying to create something of value. And in fact, what these wizards would be trying to do is they'd be trying to create gold out of lead. So alchemy is the process of turning a base metal, lead, into gold. And what I'm saying is that entrepreneurship is even better than that. It's magical, in fact. It's a dreamer's medium. It's one of the reasons why I like entrepreneurship. It's a, it's a place where you can create your own reality. There's no use trying, said Alice. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. When I was your age, I did it for half an hour each day. Why sometimes I believed in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. This is from Alice in Wonderland. So the question is, how many impossible things have you thought about today. See, you don't know what's possible. You don't know what can happen. Okay. You just have, if you, if you think you do, you're limiting your perspective. You're limiting your thinking. You just have to go out and try and the universe will determine whether or not it is possible or not. I'm an opportunist. An opportunist is someone who takes advantage of opportunity. Okay. Entrepreneurs should be opportunists as well. In fact, entrepreneurs must be entre uh, opportunists. Yes. So this is a half a day seminar on entrepreneurship, uh, the entrepreneurial mindset. And it's also building the entrepreneurial organization. Mm. So it's not just your mindset, but it's the organization itself. And it says this is a half a day seminar and we have uh, less than an hour. 
So this is where <laughs> this is where the speed is going is going to come in. Also, um, because my uh, for whatever reason PowerPoint isn't uh, working, I have some slides that I uh, don't want to show that I've deleted for uh, speed's sake. And the way that I'm going to present it right now, it looks like they're going to be in the presentation. So I'm going to skip over some slides. So I'm not I'm doing that intentionally. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So. How much value have you created today? Now, now, Justin talked about value early on. This whole thing is about creating value. If you're not creating value and you're working for someone, you're either, you're wasting his or her money and your time. And if you're working for yourself, you're wa wasting your time as well as your money. Equifinality, here's another $100 term, equifinality. What this means is that there's more than one way to get to the goal. There is no one best way. There are many different ways that you can go and still reach your goal. So sometimes people try to think of the way, the best way, or the only way. Okay, there is no the best way. There is no only way. There are many ways in which we can attain our goal. Okay, so the secret of the entrepreneurial mindset for you as the individual, as well as the organization, I've broken down here into seven parts: opportunity, the customer, organization, people, uncertainty, value, and some things to remember. So that's why it's so long. So we're going to talk a little bit about the opportunistic organization. Okay. So opportunity is always knocking, but are you listening? If your ship doesn't come in, you have to swim out to it. Some people think and wait, and they think that opportunity is going to fall in their lap. Okay. That's that good. rarely yeah. happens. You have to be, as I said before, proactive. You mm -hmm. have to go out and meet it. Sometimes you can meet it halfway. Sometimes you have to go all the way, but it requires you to go out and take action. I got my money's worth already, Dr. Terrence. <laughs> <laughs> A wise man makes more opportunities than he finds. There are very few opportunities that exist that are, that are well-formed and ready for you to exploit. Okay. You actually have to form the opportunities that you want to take advantage of. In fact, I mean, just think about this. If there were opportunities just laying around, how long do you think they would be laying around? You know, I'm, I'm awake when you're sleeping. People in China are awake when I'm sleeping. So they're taking advantage of all these opportunities if they were just laying around. They're not. So the best way that we can assure that there's an opportunity for us to take advantage of is to create that opportunity ourselves. We're not going to talk about today about how you go about creating an opportunity, but perhaps we could talk about that uh, another time, or we can talk about it one of the uh, one of the evenings in the uh, in the group. Opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. Tom Edison. Again, this is this is hard work. This requires you a lot of you. OK, but people don't want hard work. They want the easy way out. And that's good because if this was too easy, too many people could do it. And if too many people could do it, it takes the profit out of it. So what we want it to be hard and we want, oh, yeah, you don't want to do this. This is this is too hard for people like you. No, no, you don't want to do this. Knowing that <laughs> that you're lessening your competition if they get out of the way. It's the vision thing. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st uh, president of the United States. And this is a great quote here. Vision is the art of seeing the invisible. This is Jonathan Swift, the Gulliver's Travel, among other wow. things that he's written. Huh. Vision is the art of seeing things invisible. Mm. And as I said before, it's a dreamer's medium. So the internet, well, you're, you're basically create, we're basically creating an internet or an e-business, the way that we're running our, our real estate business, allows you to dream dreams you could have never dreamed before. Okay. Let's get out of here. So how do you determine what's a good idea? There are a couple of things that you need to look at. Okay. So again, as an entrepreneur, what we do is we solve problems. We solve problems that customers may have. 
but the root of the problem actually is a, is a, is a need, okay? But it's sometimes very difficult for us to, to think in terms of needs. What does this customer need? Hmm, I don't really know. One way to increase your ability to see this need is say, okay, what pain is this customer having? And you then try to be a pain reliever. <laughs> Ultimately, it's about solving a problem of a target group. And once you identify the problem, the question is, is it big? Is it a big problem or is it a small problem? Generally, problems that are big, okay, there's a bigger market for it. But of course, if there's a bigger market for it, then more people see it as well. So there's a pro and a con. Is the problem getting better or is it getting worse? Okay, if the problem is getting worse, then it's growing. That can be a good thing. But it also can be a bad thing as well because you're, more people will be drawn, drawn uh, to it. So that's one thing, problem. Second is you need to figure out in your solution, okay, your solution needs to be different than the other solutions that exist, okay? Now that's actually pretty easy to do because if the problem already exists, okay, and it's not being solved, that means that the current solutions on the marketplace or the current ways to solve the problem aren't doing the trick, aren't doing the trick. So you need to, so if you've figured out a way to actually solve the problem, by definition, the product or service that you create will be different than the ones that currently exist. Now, this is a subtle point, and I'll, I'll say it really uh, quickly again, that if there is a problem mark in the market that exists, that means that the current pro pro products and services uh, that exist in the market are not solving it. So if you actually come up with a way to solve the problem, by definition, the problem, that the solution that you've come up with has to be different than the ones that exist. And the last thing here has to do with the target market. You need to have a target market and this target market needs to be well-defined. And the way that you can define it is something I call the five questions. And it's, it has to be identifiable, reachable, ready, willing, and able. The people in the group need to be identifiable, reachable, ready, willing, and able. And oftentimes, uh, people who are starting businesses can identify and reach, but they don't think about being ready, or they don't think about, is the tar target group willing, or is the target group able? And you need to have all five of them to actually have uh, what I call customer space in um, uh, with respect to the uh, target, uh, the target market, invent, reinvent, and repeat. Once you have a solution that is profitable, that is repeatable, and that is scalable, then you need to be able to do it over and over again. This was a great Hewlett Packard ad: invent, reinvent, and repeat. And this will come up a couple of times uh, today. Let's get over here. These are some of the one slides that I wanted to delete. Now we're into the customer stage here. First lesson of managing high growth is to make the customer the center of your culture. So again, I, what did we say? We wanna create value and the best way to create value for ourselves, the owners, the shareholders is to create value for the customers, okay? And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon how you wanna look at it, you're not likely to get it right the first time. You're not likely to get it right the first time. But that's not bad because in that mini failure, there's information. In fact, in every failure, there's knowledge and information that can be gained. So you take that information and you bring it back into your process and you make an adjustment based on that. And the next time, you're gonna be closer and you may fail again, but the next time you're gonna be closer and you continue to, to recycle this information, this feedback from actual engagement with your customers and you will get closer and closer to what solution they actually require. Okay. Too much self-love. I won't go into this in too much depth. Some of you I'm sure are quite familiar with uh, self-love, but uh, 
what this means is that <laughs> you kind of uh, get trapped in your solution. You believe that your product, your solution, your way of doing things is the best. And you get wrapped up in trying to sell your product, your solution to the customer rather than trying to find out what the customer needs and providing that, okay? So if you're really customer-centered, you find out what they need and you provide that, you don't try to uh, shove something down their throat because you think it's good or your mother thinks it's good or your father thinks it's good. They don't count, okay? It's what the customer believes is true. So as we move to the organization, uh, okay, let's see. The secret of fast progress is inefficiency, fast, furious, and numerous failures. Okay. The innovative process, the creative process is a messy process. Okay. It's not a straight line. But in that messiness, okay, and in that failure, as we talked about, you learn. And each, each failure, again, gets you closer to making the solution. Thomas Edison, my, one of my... Uh, um, namesakes, because again, my name is Terrence Edison uh, Brown, you know, went through a thousand different um, items before he got the filament right for the light bulb. And they said, well, how did it feel, you know, failing all of those times? And he said he didn't fail. He said he, he did a thousand experiments to find out what didn't work. Each failure got him closer to what did work. Okay. Lots of companies in, this, in Silicon Valley fail. And this guy said, well, maybe not enough. What do you mean by that? He said, whenever you fail, okay, it means that you're trying new things. Now, some of you out there are afraid to fail. So you're so afraid to fail that you don't act. You need to act, okay? And you get used to the failure. And once you really buy into the fact that um, there's information that's going to get you closer to your goal, Okay, you will be much better um, dealing with this uh, failure. I mean, no one likes to fail, but if you know it's part of the process, you know it's getting closer to your goal. Yeah, I can deal with that. I can deal with that. Okay, this is a this is a great a great uh, quote here. Is wealth in this new regime flows directly from innovation and, and not optimization? That is, wealth is gained is not gain, is not gained by perfecting the known by imperfectly seizing the unknown, okay? By imperfectly seizing the unknown. That's a profound statement, okay? Invent, reinvent, repeat. Act now, act fast, and keep acting. It used to be the small, the big that ate the small. Now it's the fast that eat the slow. Okay, we have an advantage being small. Wow. We have an advantage of being small that we can move more quickly. We can yeah. be flexible. Okay, mm -hmm. you got to use the advantages that you have. Larger organizations, for lots of reasons, some of which we'll mention in a second, cannot move as quickly. Okay, as we can. Also, sometimes. There are uh, market segments that large organizations can't take advantage of because they're too big. Their costs are so high that they have to, uh, they have to have large market segments. We don't, we don't. So there are lots and lots of um, ways in which being small can be advantageous uh, to us. Okay. And in this learning, okay, Learning oftentimes is actually not the problem. It's unlearning. It's unlearning. We have habits, things that, you know, things that we've been, you know, it says to create a habit, it might take 28 days to 30 days. If you do something over and over, it becomes a habit and then it will stick. You know, we all have things that we've been doing for 20 and 30 years. How are we going to break out of those things? And people have been telling you since birth that you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. How do we get that out of our head so we can make room for some of these new skills and new information that we're learning and that we want to take advantage uh, of? One of, my, one of my favorite quotes. 
Don't own nothing if you can help it. If you can, wrench your shoes. And this is from FG. And FG is <laughs> Forrest Gump. Uh, oh, okay? my goodness. <laughs> and what this is about is that when we have resources, when we have assets, whether it be office space or employees or anything, it limits the decisions that we can make because we have to take care of the assets. We have to insure the assets. We have to look over the assets. We have to make, we have to make payroll. We have to have a place for the employees to sit. The more resources we have, the less flexible we come, become. So we have to figure out how do we balance owning assets and being flexible. And one way to do that again is to uh, use the res have the, the use of the resource and not necessarily the ownership of that resource. Here in IBM, we own all the intellectual property and farm out all the direct labor. And I know that the that we talk about this in the VIP group and, and Justin talks about outsourcing and when should you outsource and that, but ultimately you should be thinking about, okay, you as the owner of your business, you own the intellectual property. You develop the systems and you get other people to carry them out, okay? You don't outsource the intellectual property, you outsource the direct labor part of it, okay? And we move from an asset-based strategy to a talent-based one. We focus on identifying the right talent who then can take advantage and do the activities that we want him or her to do. So we become a, a talent manager more than anything else, identifying the right talent that has the ability to solve the problems that we need to be solved. Dell, Cisco, and a lot of companies now uh, as well, because this, this, these slides were made many years ago, is about branding. They, they own the brand. They create a brand, okay? And then they sell satisfaction, customer satisfaction. So they're, they're in the business of de developing a brand, and then all the other stuff is about customer satisfaction. So you ask them what business they're in, they're in the customer satisfaction business. They're not necessarily in the computer business, okay? Just like you. Somebody asks you what business you're in, you say, well, I'm a real estate investor. You could say that you're in the customer satisfaction business. If the customer needs X, Y, and Z, that's where you should be. Mm -hmm. This is in part why you might uh, have the intent to be uh, in ugly houses, for example, but the particular customer that you're in front of is more interested or is the, the problem he or she has is best solved by lease option. Okay, so you need to be able to then switch to lease option. Okay, because you're not trying to ram your solution down their throat. What you're trying to do again is to satisfy the customer. And if their needs are in the lease option, that's where you go. That's where you go. Outsource all the superfluous stuff. Okay, and just focus on the key. Thanks. Okay. And this is this slide talks about what I said. Again, most profitable businesses in the future are act like knowledge brokers. Again, identifying problems and then identifying the best uh, uh, human resources and talent to take care of those problems and then bringing them in and creating these uh, knowledge systems. And that's what large corporations are going to be doing, but that's what you should be doing as well. Um, yeah, this is this is this is important one here. E business is not about technology. And again, what we're talking about here is what we're building is a, a, whether it's a, a co-wholesaling or virtual co-wholesaling, whatever we're doing, or marketing using the internet, whatnot. It is a, an e business, and we tend to get get uh, locked up and, and 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 focused on the technology aspects, the website and the software and all of these things. But at the root, again, all business is personal business and it's the relationships and the partnerships and the ability to communicate that we need to focus on. Now, yes, it's going to be facilitated by new technologies and we need to take advantage of the new technologies, but it's all about relationships and communication and how well you do that. I mean, if, if you can't do those sorts of things, then the new technologies are just gonna make it worse. What if we succeed? What if we succeed? 
Okay, what does that mean? I, I have lots and lots of examples where companies, uh, of course, hope to succeed, but when they succeed, that leads directly to their failure. Because let me ask you this, you have probably a plan A. And what is plan A? Plan A is what if things work out the way that I have planned, okay? But what's plan B? Plan B is what happens if things don't work out? Only the smartest people have plan C and you need to have a plan C. What plan C is what happens if things exceed my expectations. Wow, right, wow, yeah. Because, because what, hap- what, you know, what happens, I mean, lots and lots of times where someone puts out a website and they're, you know, they're, every day they wake up in the morning, they look at their traffic reports and see how many people have come. And one day you go to, the, you go to your traffic and your traffic was at zero. And you say, well, what happened? You call up your host, and your server blew up. And the reason the server blew up is that somebody went to your site, thought it was cool, and they wrote a story about it in the New York Times or in the Wall Street Journal or the local newspaper. And as a result, 50,000 people tried to come to your site in an hour. It wasn't scalable. The thing blew up and then you only get one chance. They go to the website once and they say, this isn't gonna work. They're never gonna come again. So you need to have scalability both up and down, do the systems that mm. you build, can they scale up and they scale down? You need to have that, okay? You need to have that wow. scalability. Because even if you create a process that's profitable, and even if you create a process that's profitable and repeatable, if it's not scalable, you can't base your business on it, okay? The people, okay? Penrose, this is from 1959, and what Penrose was, she was a woman who wrote one of the most important books in management, and what she found was that the limiting factor to corporate growth, the limiting factor to business growth, was not, was not uh, financial resources, but was managerial talent, the ability to manage people, okay? I mean, mm. people who, who, who uh, quit their job, 80% of them quit because why they quit? They quit because their boss was no good. Mm, exactly. They liked the job, but the boss was no good. Yeah. So managerial talent is what you need to uh, you need to focus. Law crappy people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the law crappy people. This is the law crappy people. Okay. When you start a business, when you, start like a business you like that one? <laughs> when you yeah. start a, when you start a business, okay, um, people join it because they believe that the skills that they have are going to help you succeed and they think that it's going to be fun doing it. So you attract people who want to be in this startup, in this growing organization, okay? When the organization starts to get bigger, okay, their role changes. Now, the people joined because they liked the role they had in the beginning. So what they will do is they will leave the organization and go find that job in another company. And so what happens is the only people that stay in your business over time are the people who can't go any other place, the people who are no good. And so as your organization grows, you get a higher and higher percentage of people who can't do the job. Okay. How do you prepare for that? I know, but I'm not going to tell you right now. Only the best. Only try to focus on getting the very best people. Now, why? (laughs) The reason is the very best people are so much better than the average person. It always is to your advantage to go for the very best. And you want to have an up or out system, okay? Meaning they perform and they either perform well or they're out, okay? So, well, maybe we can train them, you know, can you teach old dogs new tricks? And the answer is, of course you can teach old dogs new tricks, but it takes a long time, it takes a lot of resources, and it's just quicker to get rid of them, okay? And get some new, uh, get some new blood. Pay, fork it over. Meaning you gotta be willing to pay the best people what they deserve, okay? Don't try to be cheap because the best people can go any place. So pay them and keep them happy. Look at this. 
the top performing companies are two to four times more likely than the rest of the companies to pay what it takes to prevent losing top performers. So the best companies know that they need to come up with the money and they need to come up with the money fast or people will leave. And Jerry Yang is the co-founder of Yahoo. We value great people at 10 times the average person because they know that the top people are more than 10 times better than the average person in terms of performance. We're not talking about they're better in any kind of way. We're just talking about their performance. Diversity, okay? Diversity is important in many types of organizations. Again, you need to focus on not who you are, but what value you can bring. It doesn't matter who the person is if they can help you get to the goal. Now, why this is an issue is because there's so many people who don't get the job because people have certain uh, opinions, let's say, on who they are. And what they're really doing is they're shooting themselves in the foot because they're not snapping these people up who can add value, can help them on the way they go. You know, we're, we're having this situation right now, of course, in the U.S. and, 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 and worldwide. But if you, even if the most ardent uh, um, how can I say this? The, um, uh, the most difficult manager uh, can be convinced with an economic or financial argument, but no one has made it uh, or presented it to them properly. Okay, They don't have to like you. All they have to do is to treat you with respect. And if you could present this argument to them, I think that it would change a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, uh, levels of diversity in different organizations. Where do, where do new good ideas come from? Oftentimes they come from this juxtaposition of difference, ha mixing different cultures and ages and disciplines and whatnot together, okay, is what creates creative solutions, creative solutions. And if you're an organization that is homogeneous, OK, you're not going to get the same level of creativity as you are in an organization that is heterogeneous. And what would happen, what happens if you, your organization is more successful? You have organization A and organization B. Organization A is heterogeneous. Their solutions are more creative. They start making more money, growing their market share. And you have company B who's homogeneous, and they're not getting the same result. Over time, the shareholders in company B say, hey, what's going on here? You need to make some change. Look at company A. And the managers and companies B would have to say, hmm, we have to copy what company A is doing as well. And they would then increase their level of diversity as well. That's the kind of argument, the financial argument, that would solve lots of the issues that are going on uh, today. Okay. Here's another one. Again, we're talking about people. Never hire anyone without an aberration in their background. What does that mean? Is that when, when you're looking at someone's background and it's too perfect, um, it's not that you have something against being you know, you know, everything perfect. The problem is, is that people who have never gone through adversity, okay, it's, a, it's risky for me to hire that person because, they're, because once they go through adversity, we don't know how they're going to react. Someone who's never had a failure comes to my organization and then has a failure and then has a breakdown or can't perform, that's not going to be helpful to me. But if I see somebody that has overcome something, whatever it is, and has come back even stronger, we know that in the struggles of building our, our business, if there's an issue, this person isn't going to cry and go home. This person isn't going to give up. This person is going to step up. Okay. Okay. Whoever is the most imprinted has the best chance. And this is uh, Mozart. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Amadeus, you could understand this uh, exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, we're all unique. One size never fits all. One size fits one size, period. Okay. The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it. It's that it's too low 
and we reach it. Let me say that again. The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it's too low and we reach it. And this is Michael Angelo. Powerful. Powerful. Yep. Uncertainty. People don't like uncertainty generally. I do. Okay. <laughs> There's lots of opportunity uncertainty. And we're, and this, is, this is from Steve Case, who was the uh, founder of uh, American Online, AOL. And this is from 20 years ago. There will be more confusion in business world in the next decade than any decade in history. And this is still true. Just what look what's happened in the first half of, two, of 2020. Nobody could anticipate in any of this sort of stuff. You don't know what's going to be happening. You need to be ready. You need to be open. You need to have your powder dry, your eyes open. Okay. We're in a brawl and there are no rules. Okay. There are no rules. Okay. Value. Okay. Think, I mean, Apple's uh, advertisement was think different. And I'm saying think, think weird. These are from two uh, Swedes who had a, uh, 20 years ago had a really popular book called Funky Business. It, surplus society has a surplus of similar companies employing similar people with similar education backgrounds, working in similar jobs, coming up with similar ideas, producing similar things, similar prices and similar quality. Okay, everything is the same. That's crying out for you to be different. It's crying out for you to think different. It's crying out for you to act differently. If we're in a, we're in a situation where we're trying to uh, t- stand out, okay, it's not hard to stand out if everything is so similar. Okay. The future has already happened. It's just not evenly distributed. We don't have to try to think what's gonna happen in the future because the future already exists. In some things, it's in South Korea. In some things, it's here in Sweden. In some things, it's in uh, uh, Seattle, Washington. In some things, it's in Beijing, China. We need to just be aware, see what's going on. Okay, we don't have to predict anything. Things are already happening. Okay, I'm not a fan of best practice, and, and this is in part why because we you focus on best practice. Okay, every, every organization becomes similar. We don't want best, pra- we don't want to be like everybody else. So why are we going to follow the best practices? We want to be different. We want to be differentiated. We want to solve problems in a different creative way. We want to create value for customers in a different way because people are willing to pay for that. That means that our profitability is going to be greater if we could solve solutions, uh, provide solutions that are different than what other people are providing them. Radical strategies required. I mean, just think about this. Banking is necessary. Banks are not. Which is why we're having all sorts of these uh, digital banks and e-banks and all these things happening. Because it's the, it's the services that we need. We don't need the bank. So how do you perceive your business, your real estate business this way? Hmm? Uh, Super Bowl coach and Hall of Fame coach Bill Parcells. Blame nobody, expect nothing, but do something. Simplicity, okay? Make it simple, okay? One reason why you make it simple is because so you can do it, okay? Another reason to make it simple is that you have to then share and, and, and communicate these processes to those folks that you are going to manage or you're going to outsource. So, so try to make things as simple as you can, okay? Because then you can outsource it. I mean, I remember when McDonald's started um, changing their, their cash registers um, where, you know, people would say they were kind of dumbing it down and they were kind, I mean, you could say they were dumbing it down, but, you know, instead of having um, the person have to put, okay, this hamburger was 55 cents and trying to do that, you just put a picture of the hamburger on the cash register, the person has to bring. simple. What does that do? That lowers the the um, the hurdle for me. I don't have to hire people with such a high education. I it increases my pool of my pool of folks that I can hire. Okay. Now on the on the um, on the bad side, I'm dumbing it down. On the good side, a lot of people are dumb, and they don't have a job. So I'm inc- I'm giving them a I'm giving them a job. So I mean it's it's uh, you know half a dozen. 
Okay. Let's get out of here. We're almost done here. Almost done. What is the value added proposition? We talked about this a little bit last time in February when I was on. Is what is your value uh, value added proposition? Okay, your value proposition again is it's the value that you convey to your customers when they are paying you. Okay, and it includes both tangible things and intangible things. You know, so if you're if you're selling a um, you know, the value proposition of a Mercedes is the actual mechanical car, which is a tangible asset, but it's intangibles as well. The ability to flash those keys, a sense of uh, security when you drive it, a sense of luxury. Um, it makes you feel better. And all of those things have value and people are willing to pay substantially for that. Okay, basically the car the car is better, okay? The car is better, but it's not that much better than other cars. But when you start stacking up prestige and, 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 and how it makes you feel and the luxury and the safety and everything else, then the price is really, really high. That means that you can do a service that's relatively same as your competitors, but you can stack other services on top in order to pay to get them to pay much more, to increase or expand your margins. Things to remember, okay, things to remember. Uh, well, let's, let's, this, this, this is an important one, I think that applies here to, what, to us. In the funky village, real competitors no longer revolve around market share. We're competing for attention, mind share and heart share, okay? And in this internet world, again, we're trying to compete for attention. Okay, we're trying to get a part of their mind share and a part of their heart share. I mean, there are lots of uh, real estate uh, coaches and gurus and whatnot out there. But part of the reason that we're here with Justin has to do with this, this heart share, the sense that we believe that he cares for us and he demonstrates that he cares for us by having you know six days a week uh, um, uh, meetings and all of this free information and blah blah and all this other kind of stuff, and you as a investor need to convince your customers of the same sort of thing that you actually are that actually you care. That's a way to differentiate you and get the customer's attention. When other people are out there um, banging pots and pans, how do you gain attention? You know, how do you build this trust and, 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 that sort of, and that sort of thing? Create a cause, not a business, okay? You must be the change in the world, okay? You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Okay, you just say, oh, we want, we want the world to change. You have to be the change first. It starts with you. Okay, and people will see your change and that will kind of infect them and begin a snowball effect to, to change, uh, to change uh, things. Mario Andretti, things seem under control. You're not going fast enough. So again, you always need to be on the edge where things are just about to spin, under, spin out of control. That's where you know you're going and moving fast enough, okay? This is one of the last slides here. It's uh, from Mark Twain. The best swordsman in the world does not have to fear the second best swordsman in the world. The person for him to be afraid of is the ignorant antagonist who has never had a sword in his hand before. He doesn't know a thing uh, what he should do. And so the expert isn't prepared for him. He does the things he ought not to do and it often catches the expert out and ends him on the spot. Wow. <laughs> if, I'm the, if I'm the best swordsman, I don't have to worry about the second best swordsman or the third best swordsman because I know that I can beat them. But the kid who's never picked up a sword and doesn't know what the rules are, he can start just slashing without the, you know, before the man blows the whistle and I could be dead. Dangerous, yeah. Dangerous. I mean, it, we talk about the digital music. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, 
they didn't know anything about 19 year old uh, Napster creator at University of Michigan freshman who totally has changed the music industry when we started uh, uh, sharing files. They weren't worried about him. They were worried about CBS records. They weren't worried about a 19 year old. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. So this is again from wow. 20, this is, this is 20 years ago. In 25 years, you'll be able to get some total of all knowledge on a personal device. Now we know that we can do that and we could, we've been, been able to do this for 10 years ago. In 2000, that he thought it was going to be 25 years. And now, you know, it, it's, uh, it only took 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. Invest, invent, reinvent, repeat. Again, equifinale. Remember, you, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one best way. You don't have, you can create your own, okay? You don't have to follow someone necessarily. And A, B, C, V, always be creating value. We know that A, B, C is always be closing, but this is also A, B, C, but with a V, always be creating value. So how much value did you create today? Now it's early in the morning for you, although it's evening for me. And uh, so you still have time to create value today, but I can, I will be able to measure how much value I created today when I start to see some of you put some of these things into, uh, into action. Okay. When you get a chance to, uh, to let it, uh, uh, let it seep in, when you get a chance perhaps to look at the slides again, and then you will, uh, I will be able to see if I've created value. I think I have. But oh, yes, absolutely. We don't know. We don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. So that is what I wanted to uh, to say. Um, questions? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Questions for sure. Anybody has questions? I, I wanted to say or comments or anything. Um, I wanted to say that uh, what what really struck me, and there's so much you can pull from what you just shared. But what really struck me is that I see more clearly now that we as an individual, as a small enterprise, a small company, maybe it's just you, maybe it's just me, maybe it's you and a virtual assistant, or you have in many ways more advantages than, let's say, Sprint or <laughs> some other huge corporation, you have some real distinct advantage, advantages being the small guy, the small innovator, the small entrepreneur. Am I right? Am I reading that right? No, you're reading that right. I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, we have this, uh, these new uh, companies that are using AI to acquire uh, uh, wholesale uh, real estate. I can't think of what they're called. Uh, uh, offhand, but some of these companies that are the e buyers, the i buyers, the e buyers, yeah, the e buyers, yeah, the, yeah, the, the e -buyers. and a lot of uh, real estate, individual real estate wholesale folks are getting uh, uh, worried that their their market is going away. They don't need to worry about that. One, the real estate market is is so big that there's plenty of space uh, for everybody. But also, they have certain costs that they have to meet, and their costs are higher than your costs because they are so big they will not be able to take deals that are um, complex. They won't be able to, they, they have to have really cookie cutter sorts of deals or they won't be able to do, it won't fit, it won't fit their system. So that means that it opens up a whole host of opportunities for us to take advantage of. You're exactly right that there are huge opportunities for us being uh, small. And when we're talking about small, we're talking about the right the single individual. We're not talking about that small. I mean, these all these organizations are billion dollar organizations. There's still plenty of million dollar opportunities for us uh, as well. Well, sure. You were talking about the need for speed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the need to be able to change directions quickly, to invent and then reinvent based on results. Um, those things a corporation takes time to turn a large cruise ship around, but an individual, um, you guys can, you can change right now, right, right this minute, <laughs> right? It takes years sometimes 
for these organizations to change. And of course, you use that uh, cruise ship or battleship. You know, it takes like seven, eight miles for the battleship even to stop, let alone let alone turn around. Uh, we can turn on a dime. Hmm. Okay. Uh, especially if we are using the technology, especially if we don't have a lot of uh, assets that are tying us down, we can be flexible and we can take advantage of, uh, of a whole host of, of opportunities that exist. Yeah, that's great. That's incredible. Who's got questions in the Zoom room? Anybody, uh, anybody got questions in the Zoom room here today or comments? Feel free to unmute your microphone, guys. And uh, yeah, everybody's head is head is hurting as I said. <laughs> everybody's so so confused and like yeah. I can't take anymore. No, uh, right. not um, so much hey. confused. Yeah, not so much confused, but just absolutely enlightened. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to share this information. Uh, one of the things that stood out to me is. Um, competition is not nearly as large as we imagine it to be because so few people are really trying. And the other one was the law of crappy people, <laughs> mm -hmm. which I love, which explains a lot of organizations that we see, even within our industry, even within the small part of our industry where people just get stuck on certain things and they're not innovative and they don't provide service and they don't provide an opportunity to, you know, really serve the customer. And um, from what I hear, the opportunity is in really recognizing the need and serving the customer effectively. That's absolutely true. I think even before that is trying to define who the customer actually is, you know, trying to do a, they call them avatars or personal profile. Mm -hmm where you really detail who your customer is, you know, where do they live? What school did they go to? How, you know, how old are they? What hobbies do they have? And you really define who the customer uh, is. And in doing that, you know who the customer is, but you also know who the customer isn't. And so you know how to better, once you know who they are, you can find out where are these folks hanging out, okay? There are lots of customers out there. You just have to find out where these guys hang out, but to know where they hang out, you have to know who they are. And then you need to craft, I say craft, what craft means is to create uh, with, with some thought. You have to craft an opportunity to, uh, uh, a solution for the problem that they are, uh, that they're having, okay? And if you, you know, if you are very creative in segmenting your market, so um, uh, you can have a mass market, okay? Now a mass market is, you know, where you're basically selling to anybody or you can have a more segmented market. And it's just like an orange segments, they're different segments to the market, which is a narrow, but a homogeneous uh, uh, group. If you can segment your market uh, creatively, there might not be lots of folks that are going after this particular group. I mean, for example, let's do some, I mean, let's do something uh, in, in class. I always uh, talk about, um, Lots and lots of products are targeted to the urban male uh, gay market they, because they don't have children. They haven't high. They're both men, uh, both white men in particular, that have lots of high high income and they live in the city, so they have lots of disposable income. So lots of products and services are targeted towards them, even in a testing uh, way or targeting them as the as, as the end user. So with that in mind, who's creating products for the less educated gay male that lives in the country? Yeah. Okay, no one, but they still have needs. They still wanna buy, they still wanna buy things, but no one's talking about them. Or let's say more, a more relevant one with respect to a real estate in investment. Have you ever thought about limiting your real estate investing to a profession. Hmm. What, what, are you, what are you talking about, Terrence? Yeah. What I'm talking about is say, okay, let, let's say your profession is, uh, uh, let's say, who do we have here? We have, uh, I'm sorry, sir, I, I, I see you, but I don't know your name that I was just speaking with. Oh, Victor. Victor, okay. Yeah. I can't, for All some right. reason, I couldn't see it on the screen. So Victor, what, what profession are you? What do you do? 
Now, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I've always been, uh, and that I do thing. real estate. I do acting, and I do a couple other things, but all, okay. you know, yeah. Okay. Let's say you were a plumber. Okay. I okay. do plumbing. Let's say you, yep. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> I do once in a while, too. In fact, once or twice a day, but yeah, yeah. So <laughs> let's, say, let's say we focus on uh, distressed plumbers. Mm -hmm. that's it okay now i'm a plumber mm -hmm. i know where plumbers hang out i know what they have i know how they think okay and i want to buy real estate from plumbers do you think anybody out there is doing that probably not probably not okay mm -hmm. probably not so if we define our market properly okay we may not have any competition Okay. Now, on the other hand, okay, it, even if you, we have lots of competitors that are, we, we're calling them competitors, we don't really have competitors. For example, Coke. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Coke, I'm a Coke, I'm a Coke drinker. I, I drink uh, Coke rather than uh, Pepsi, but we know that there are hundreds of different colas out there. Okay. But does Coke have competition? You could argue yes. I'm going to argue no, because Coke is it. Coke is it. If I want the value proposition that Coke is offering, the only drink I can buy is Coke. Okay. So if you create a value proposition if you create a brand around the services that you are offering, there may be lots of other people selling similar services to you, but if they want the value proposition, the bundle of, of uh, offerings, both tangible and tangible that you're offering, there's only one place to go. And that's Victor. So you have to define, you have to say, okay, th I'm Victor. These are what, these are the services that I provide. Okay, and no one else provides these one, these services, and no one else provides these services as, as well as I. So you may go to other people, but you're going to have an inferior experience. But if you want the Victor experience, there's only one place that you can go, and that's the Victor. And if you want the Victor experience, you're going to have to pay a little bit for it because that costs. So that that helps you with your pricing, helps in, helps you with your margins, helps you with your marketing. So lots of different ways in which you can play with this, either on the value proposition side, the product or service you're offering, or the target market side. That's just brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, that, no, no, um, no problem. that kind of changes. Yeah, because you, you create a brand and then you make that brand indispensable, so to speak. Just like mm -hmm. you were saying about Coke. Coke, you know, there's all sorts of other colas but when we think of them, we call them Coke. We never think of tissue, we think of Kleenex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, they, they, and that's all positioning and we have the opportunity to do the same thing. Exactly, yeah. create a brand and position yourself. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. You know, the story of the best swordsman in the yes. world, needing fear, um, the second and third best, but fear the guy who has never picked up a sword before. Correct. Wow. Was that Mark Twain, Dr. Terry? Mark Twain. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, some of us feel that way. I think where it's like, well, I, I don't know all that you, you were talking about there. I mean, I must not be um, good enough to start a business or smart enough or, or, you know, I, I lack these resources or, or this talent or these trainings. And um, I, I'm always needing to learn more before I get started. Um, spending a lot of time in Lawson YouTube University. But but the, the fact is, um, according to the principle of that story, that if you just got started, just pick it up untrained. Um, because in a sense, you're dangerous already. I, I, am I right? Yeah, it's the it's the naive it's the naive person that's super dangerous, and also the naive question. 
it's I mean countless times again when you you go to some uh, high powered academic uh, lecture and you have some guy Nobel laureate type folks giving some sort of uh, lecture and uh, and they're ready for their colleagues question you know but then when a high schooler comes up and say uh ex excuse me and the guy says yes son how can i help you my question is <laughs> you know, why is the sky blue <laughs> and the guy's like ah oh. you know it's the it's those naive questions that are the killers yeah they don't know what the rules are they don't know that they, they should that that they shouldn't ask questions like that um and on, you don't know that you shouldn't, you know, market this way or you shouldn't sell this way or whatever. They they don't know that. And and even if they do, they don't care. So absolutely. I mean, I think that there's uh, it's uh, it's certainly scary to always scary to get the to get started. But it's the naive person that has uh, some advantages. In fact, um, the more, you know, the uh, the more limiting it is. The more you know, the more limiting it is because you know what you're not supposed to do, or you know how things are kind of going to go, in a, yeah. uh, you know. And so you have to, uh, it's a, it, you have to ba balance, you have to balance it uh, a little bit. Wow, yeah, incredible information. Um, guys, go visit askdrbrown.com. Yeah, um, just redid, just redid the site. Right now, it's just a couple of uh, pictures and a couple of uh, an article or two, but there'll be more. Uh, there'll be more there uh, soon, and hopefully this summer we'll start putting up some uh, some video content in the Ask Dr. Brown uh, YouTube channel as well. Uh, give us a little bit of your, if you don't mind, before we wrap up today. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any comments or questions, but um, give us a little bit of your your resume because I I could not do it justice. It, it's that extensive. Um, so because I don't think people fully understand who you are well uh again if uh, if i was coming to a, a lecture with somebody that i didn't know i would google them but uh, and you still can you can do that but uh yeah i, I i'm originally from uh, new jersey um uh, i uh i went to uh to brown university and uh have a a, a triple major economics political science and organizational behavior and i went then to wharton and uh, got an MBA in uh, uh, entrepreneurial management and speculative markets. Uh, what happened then? I started a, uh, a chain, a small chain of uh, eyeglass uh, stores and, and, and whatnot and had some limited success and then got out of that. And uh, what else did I do? I was a, uh, <laughs> I, I was a public housing director in my town but my town did not was too wealthy to have any uh, uh, public housing, so we would pay a town nearby to have the public housing for for us, uh, which was kind of uh, strange. And I, I always was interested in uh, uh, business, and um, I started my first corporation when I was uh, thirteen uh, to sell uh, to publish a science fiction magazine and to sell fishing worms and. Uh, uh, hmm. <laughs> actually, yeah. And, um, anyway, so I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if, you know, I could uh, get paid to read about the business and, uh, someone said, you can, you know, if you, you know, get your PhD and whatnot. So I said, okay. So I went and got a, a PhD in, in, uh, in entrepreneurship at, uh, uh, at, uh, Rutgers. And, uh, on the way there, I got a second, uh, MBA. Uh, that one is in organizational uh, management. And uh, then I went to, uh, after I finished that, I went to uh, Sweden for a couple of years and, uh, and pretty much, uh, pretty much stayed. Uh, and so I've been here for about 25 years. And uh, I picked up a, a second uh, PhD uh, last year or year before last in, uh, in marketing. So I have uh, two PhDs. Uh, and two and two MBAs as well, and then the triple major uh, as well. And I've, I've been involved in uh, developing the uh, the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship, which is a top school of entrepreneurship here in uh, in in 
in Europe, but I've been at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden here for uh, for over 20 years as well, teaching entrepreneurship and innovation to uh, engineers and uh, as well as uh, as, as well as business leaders. And I been involved in venture capital in, in Denmark and in, uh, in Sweden as well, uh, advising businesses. And lots of my students have uh, uh, businesses out there and some of them that you know of and some are, are uh, uh, billion dollar businesses and some are, are, are less, uh, less big. Um, yeah, and so what, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen now is I'm going to, uh, one of the things that I always wanted to do is to um, uh, kind of what I call translation. And translation is, is basically taking kind of more academic theory and making it more accessible to non-academics. And so that's what I'm going to uh, do as part of this uh, Ask Dr. Brown uh, sort of uh, thing. Because I'm kind of an oddball in, in the sense that I actually talk about money and I also, <laughs> it, as an academic, and also uh, help Biz, people actually build businesses, and that's kind of atypical for a, 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 um, a strict academic. So, uh, uh, since I'm looked at with a kind of a skew eye anyway, I might as well go uh, go all the way. So that's what, <laughs> so that's, that's so that's what I'm going to be uh, uh, doing. So that's, uh, that's that's I mean that's basic that's basically the uh, the the skeleton uh, of it. That's what I love about Dr. Terrence Brown, Dr. Dr. Terrence Brown, two PhDs, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that a, a gentleman, like he was saying, is pretty atypical for um, an academic, um, someone of this, this much learning, and he has this much knowledge to want to cater it to people that are like, like me. You know, I'm just, uh, you know, I got a two year degree. <laughs> okay. Um, but when you get to know Dr. Terrence and you listen to him for a little, little minute, um, you discover he really has a heart for the man on the streets that, that's really trying to start something, bootstrap something. Um, people like people like us here in the Real Estate Wholesalers Club, um, you know, ha have a dream in your heart and want to move forward with it. Have an idea that can change something and make it better but don't have the education, the training, the money, the resources, the family background, blah, 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 man. He's got a heart for these kind of people. And uh, that's, I feel honored that he's um, decided to spend some of his time here with me. And I have always gleaned a lot from Dr. Dr. Terrence Brown. Thank you very much, sir, for coming on with us today. Again, thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, he is in the VIP club guys. So if you want to write a nice note to him today in the, the Facebook uh, group, or you think of a question that you didn't ask before in the VIP Facebook group, go ahead and ask that question. Um, and Dr. Terrence, I don't know what time it is over there where you're at, but you're probably getting ready for dinner or, or bedtime. Or yeah, something, it's, right? it's, it's seven hours. So when you start your midnight thing, I'm, I'm, uh, I have to sound <laughs> off because it's, <laughs> But, That's okay. Uh, yeah, it's seven hours ahead. Uh, well, hey, you have a great rest of your day then, sir. And enjoy your evening and stay safe out there. I hope you and your family are healthy. We didn't ask that. Is everybody doing okay? It's, everybody's know, everybody's doing oh, everyone's doing okay. And uh, you know, one daughter actually they had a, actually a uh, uh, what do you call it a uh, uh, demonstration in support of what's going on in the U S yesterday. So one yeah. of the daughters was out, uh, out doing that, but everyone is healthy from uh, COVID as you, you know, Sweden's in the news a lot in the U S I know about mm. doing it a little bit differently. Uh, yeah. we didn't, we didn't lock down at all. We did, <clears throat> we did, uh, didn't do anything. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, they, uh, so, I mean, we, so we took a, a hit in terms of deaths, uh, among, among seniors, but they, mm. uh, but the economy kept running. So mm. there was a trade off wow. of the, uh, the Swedish government uh, took. Wow. But, uh, wow. Yeah. And today actually is the national day. It's like 4th of July here today. Uh, really? really? Yeah. June 6th. Yeah. So well, that's uh, great. Well, well happy 4th of July to, uh, to Sweden. Huh. Thank you. Oh, there's some, some notes in the chat room. I didn't even see it here. So is there anything I need to. Yeah. I've been lots of chat today, Dr. Brown. 
<laughs> I didn't. I didn't look uh, at it at all. Lots of chat. Um, mostly just it's like they were your A man corner. Um, <laughs> have you done any work podcast wise, anything like this with uh, Mr. Sherman Ragland? Oh, he's my brother. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Have you done anything? Uh, uh, are you we, are you biologically brothers? We're not biologically brothers, but uh, <laughs> but uh, he's uh, you know he's. Uh, my, he's my he's my brother. Yeah, we, lived, we 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 went to school together. We lived together. Uh, his best man in the we, in his, uh, wedding, and I talked to him all the time. Yeah. yeah. And when I was in the U, when I was in the U.S. Uh, last uh, last time, I stayed with him and, and whatnot. Yeah. Do you see do you see some of his stuff or does he? Incredible content, also. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was wondering if you guys ever linked up for some uh, synergistically incredible content. You know, yeah, we we have to. Uh, yeah, we we. I'm sure I'm sure we will, especially if I if I can actually <laughs> demonstrate that I can be consistent in producing some content. <laughs> but, uh, oh. Yeah, do you, but do you do you know him? Do you want me to put you in contact with him? I I don't personally know him, but I would love for him to come on and be a guest too. I don't know if anybody out yeah. here in the room is familiar with Sherman Ragland, but um, wow, and great. I mean. These men are. I'm talking about impressive men. Uh, yeah, Dr. Real, Terrence real and Sherman investors. And Raglan. Yeah. yeah, real investors. Uh, yeah, the dean of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it's surprising that you that you brought yeah. that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, if you can make the connection, that'd be Absolutely. great. Oh, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could do that easily. <laughs> oh, Dr. Terrence, I love you so much. Thank you so much. You're such a kind man. Okay. So generous. You you be blessed, sir. And thank you everybody thank you. in the Zoom room. We'll, we'll, so we'll see much. you again. Okie doke. Talk to you later. We'll see you next week, guys. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thanks.